Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to uh, today's topic and uh, we have yet another interesting one on the application areas and this is on characterization of tissues in uh, ultrasound and I would be specifically uh, speaking about intravascular ultrasound and uh, the whole nature about characterizing uh, soft tissues within intravascular ultrasound. So, let us get down to uh, how it is organized. So, I will be starting down with an introduction and following down on to uh, brief uh, uh, overview and drag drop of uh, the ultrasonic imaging uh, within intravascular ultrasound uh, specifically. So, since we have already studied about ultrasonic imaging and how it is done, so you are you all are pretty much well aware of uh, the physics of the instrumentation of imaging as well as uh, some properties of how ultrasounds behave uh, within biological soft tissues as well. So, we take up from there and then go into the signal analytics model and then understand how signals behave and what are the amplitude behaviors, what are the distribution density functions for them and eventually from there we will end up getting into one of the major challenges with soft tissue imaging which is called as a limited resolution challenge and the reason why limited resolution comes over here as to it is not just increasing the number of uh, transducers which would transducer elements which would help you uh, get rid of the uh, problem of limited resolution, but why it will not uh, lead to that one. From there I would uh, enter into something called as the statistical mechanics or the statistical physics of ultrasonic imaging which will uh, explain about the different uh, stro uh, stochastic models which describe how ultrasound uh, signals can be interpreted which come down from different tissues and whether they are there are any tissue specificities available for these different kind of ultrasound uh, 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 amplitude values uh, which you get done when reflected from uh, the tissue. So, using all of this uh, we have a solution which I would be discussing about uh, how you can leverage these kind of uh, newer techniques uh, in order to do tissue characterization. So, with that I would uh, move over to some experiments and results of what we have uh, achieved in the recent past and then obviously again I would be drawing down onto domain adaptation uh, for in vivo use of all of these methods because whatever we had done on experiments till then uh, was based on cadaveric data or in vitro acquired data and uh, from the last discussions which we had over the course of time and from the previous lectures you are pretty much well aware of that. Uh, the actual final goal for medical image analysis is to make it useful for uh, in vivo data and until you are making it working on in vivo data your solutions are not coming into practical use. So, let us start with the very basic introduction of uh, what I meant by uh, tissue characterization and what, what this whole uh, idea is about. So, basically if you look at the human body then you have uh, lots of organs and, and you they are made out of different kinds of tissues and one of these kind of tissues is called a soft tissue. So, how they characterized is pretty much simple. So, hard tissues are the ones like bones, uh, your tooth. So, these are the ones where uh, which are really mechanically hard and soft tissues are like your skin, muscles adipose tissue. So, this is one which are mechanically quite soft and then they just offer some sort of a protective coating on your body act as a shock absorbing buffer or um, uh, it is like skin is, is a thermoregulator which your body has. So, we are looking specifically at these soft tissues and since we are pretty much aware by now looking into the concepts of ultrasonic imaging that it is one of the uh, best use is to do it for imaging of soft tissues and trying to find out uh, soft tissue abnormalities and contrast between them rather than use it for uh, hard tissue imaging where uh, much more predominant use would actually be of uh, computer tomography and x-ray modality based. The other modality which is obviously used for soft tissue imaging is definitely magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, but we are sticking down only to ultrasound as of now for its flexibility purpose. Now, if we go down together, so what happens is with these soft tissue conditions, sometimes in the soft tissues there would be some sort of an abnormality, which in general is what we define as uh, pathologies. And uh, some of them are really critical. And so, one of those critical ones is say a plaque formation within your uh, blood vascular system, which is about. Uh, so, what happens in this case is that you have your blood vessels which is sort of a pipe 
and then within that you will have cholesterol depositions this is uh, basically a physiological disease uh, condition in which you have cholesterol which is just depositing on the walls over here now as imagine this one that there is a pipe and then uh, there is some deposition going down over there so eventually this pipe bore is going to get clogged and once that happens then blood cannot flow down through the artery so this kind of a condition is what is called as atherosclerosis or even is called as hardening of the artery now this is one of the uh, problems which will happen down in case of soft tissues now from there uh, another problem is that uh, in in case of women uh, with breast they can be lesions which are uh, not necessarily always cancerous but they are just tumors or some sort of an abnormality over there so these are again another kind of uh, soft tissue abnormality which is is quite predominant in the world the other one is uh, about retina so since we have already done about uh, our class on retinal image analysis so you are pretty much well aware of what that means but the these also are uh, objects or organs where you have lot of uh, problems with soft tissues and you need to have some modality of handling soft tissue abnormalities very carefully and the other one is definitely skin uh, one of the major areas and the major abnormality is actually wound so you can get bruises cuts or there can be burns and all of these lead to some sort of an abnormality on the skin as well now the traditional practice for uh, understanding any sort of a soft tissue abnormality is to actually do a some sort of a biopsy based investigation so what's also called as a histological investigation so this is basically an invasive way in which what you do is you have surgically or or some way you remove a part of the tissue from your body so there is a small cut made and the tissue is removed outside and then it's processed and then put on a glass slide and put under a microscope for uh, microscopic detailed observation now the challenge which comes out of all of this is that it's it's a very invasive procedure and you cannot always do these kind of invasive procedures in in uh, living human beings on their vessels because this would mean that you have to in order to investigate whether there is an abnormality on a vessel you are basically going to cut down a small part of the vessel and pull it out now that's not feasible practically so you cannot do a histological investigation on vessels similarly for breast although it's done breast biopsy is quite common but it's a very painful process as such and if we can find out some way of getting rid of it that would obviously be much more appreciable you can definitely not do it on the retina because the moment you try to probe the retina uh, by this invasive method you are going to damage the retina in any ways i mean either way either in order to investigate whether you have a perfect disease or not you are going to damage the retina in any ways if you are not even investigating it would naturally damage after a few years so it's it's not technically feasible to do it um and similarly for wounds i mean if we would generally like to investigate clinically as to whether the wound is healing and that would mean that there are multiple layers of skin and whether each of these layers of skin are growing out in a perfect way but the problem is the moment you want to do that so say this is the skin and i want to look into this layers i'm going to chunk out a part of tissue over there so that means that in order to understand whether a wound is healing i'm going to inflict another wound over there and pull out the tissue and do it so these are the major technical challenges why you can sometimes not use biopsy within a clinical environment setting and this whole uh, tissue characterization thing is what comes into play for investigating a histological equivalent in condition when you cannot do a biopsy so if you want to look into a blood vascular system so uh, a basic details of it is generally when the whenever there is a plaque formation or atherosclerosis going on this is what would happen over there and uh they lead to something which is called as cardiovascular disease and uh, there are a lot of techniques for in vivo imaging of these ones so there is ct angiography mr angiography which are basically for localization and uh, one of these uh, detail investigation methods is was called as an intravascular ultrasound so what is typically done is that a ultrasound probe is put within over here which rotates 360 degree totally and then it produces this sort of a polar scanned out image and then on this image you can look down uh, for cross sections but then for an untrained eye this would basically appear as just a black and some some white spots over there and not of much major sense so the whole of intravascular ultrasound tissue characterization is what deals with instead of showing this kind of an image can we show something which is almost like this or equivalent to a histological image so that's the basic problem statement which we do now this is very useful because we would like to assess plaque vulnerability in terms of uh, very precisely identifying whether there is a calcification versus there is some sort of fibrosis over there and the other one is we would like to investigate uh, a lipid pool versus a necrotic burden and and what what is the condition of the necrosis so these are the major clinical uh, indicators which need to be investigated 
from uh, intravascular ultrasound as well for when investigating out these vascular structures. Now, there have been quite a lot of uh, contributions in the past and some of them uh, include uh, papers to commercial products as well and one of them is called as a spectral analysis method. So, what it does is uh, whatever received ultrasound signal is there. So, say you have a um, 20 megahertz probe which is uh, imaging your artery. So, you send out a 20 megahertz signal and then whatever you are receiving you use a wide band uh, receiver for receiving it. So, obviously, you are getting your fundamental frequency at 20 megahertz, but when it interacts with tissues and due to motion and all of this. So, there would be a spectral spread right over there. So, now we also try to the although the emitted one was a very narrow band 20 megahertz precise emission, but the received one is a wide band. So, it is centered almost at 20 megahertz, but then the bandwidth is much higher. So, those kind of analysis is what is called a spectral analysis. So, that was started somewhere in 1983s by Lisi and it continued going on and we have two uh, commercially available products called as virtual histology from Volcano and IMAP from Boston Scientific, which make use of this kind of methods in order to characterize tissues. Now, from that uh, a bit later on uh, in time, so somewhere around uh, in 2010. So, we had these methods which were making use of uh, texture analysis in ultrasound signals and images in order to find out what kind of tissues they belong to and there was a quite amount of good success coming down. But the major thing is that they these all of these methods are still limited because they do not identify what is a heterogeneous tissue composition. So, what that means typically is that our body you you never have a pure tissue which means that uh, if I say that there is fatty tissue over there. So, there would be some fibrocytes as well there, there would be uh, some epithelial cells over there as well. So, it is never a pure fatty tissue which is over there. So, you need to somehow identify what is the coexistence or the relative co-occurrence of these mixed heterogeneous tissues and that none of them is possible with all of these prior methods which we have. The next one is that uh, all of these methods fail to discriminate between dense fibrous tissue and calcification because both of them exhibit a very steady uh, speckle behavior as you see over there. So, just just none of them have been able to do that in the past and then uh, all of these do definitely fail to discriminate between your true, ne true necrosis from shadows and what that means is that uh, uh, over here you would see that uh, whenever there is a calcification. So, since there is a sharp reflection happening over there. So, most of the acoustic signal is just reflected from this part and then beyond it since you do not have any signal which is penetrating neither is able to come back. So, you would see a perfect shadow coming down. So, that is a perfect black region. A similar kind of region is also exhibited by a necrotic pool somewhere over here and what that means is over there the content is so homogeneous that uh, there are no scattering uh, particles present over there and since nothing can be scattered out. So, you do not get a speckle intensity coming down over there. Now, how do you discriminate between uh, a shadow and a true necrotic region? This is another challenge which has not been solved in any of them because visually they look pretty much similar to each other. So, with these challenges is what I would be discussing one of the uh, basically a series of papers, but a major contribution from one of the papers. So, the backdrop starts something like this that uh, as I was explaining you the histological perspective. So, what I would uh, try to do is if I want to investigate a plaque within an artery in a actual histological sense then I would have to pluck out this artery and then do some sort of a block preparation over there. So, take out that piece of artery then uh, do a biochemical processing to dry it and fix it so that it hardens and then you put it inside a block of wax to harden it even more and then you do thin slicing of it say consider slicing of bread over here it will be slicing of tissue and we use a machine called as microtome to do that and then you mount them onto a slide glass slide and then stain them and after that you would be looking into a microscope and then you see something of this kind over there. Now, in terms if you look in the engineering perspective of a transfer function then what comes out is that on this microscope uh, we are going to illuminate with white light as we have learnt in a microscopy lectures. So, you illuminate this mass of tissue over here which is mounted on the slide with white light and then uh, what you get down on the response is something like this. So, for each pixel you have some sort of a transfer curve over there. Now, based on the intensity whether you are looking at blue and uh, what is the intensity of red you will be able to tell what is the relative density of these two kinds of uh, tissues over there whether it is calcified or fibrotic and this is typically for a H and D stain tissue which we are looking down. Now, in sense what it translates down to is that there is some sort of a probing energy which goes through it and there is some sort of a physiological property which is say f of uh, that particular object over there. Now, what we want to do in tissue characterization is we want to find out what is this f inverse over here which would give me 
as to what is the relative distribution of the tissues by looking into the total histological image over there. Now, if we take this one and then translate it directly onto our ultrasound space, what that ends up giving is say I have this scanning ultrasound probe over here which circularly rotates and then it sends a pulse it receives back the same pulse over there. So, I have a series of signals coming down and now on that stack of signals I need to do some sort of a mathematical model which is going to end up giving me this sort of a model which will just be giving me relative density of these different tissues in different colors. So, over here my forward function will be this acoustic energy and then this tissue backscattering density over there. Now, I need to find out some way of inverting this whole function such that on this inversion I am able to get this sort of a map coming down. So, this is in essence what tissue characterization is mathematically defined as and that is what we try to solve. But the problem is that it is not so easy to do it because you will never get down pure tissues and the reason is within this limited resolution challenge. So, what would happen is say I have a ultrasound transducer and it is emitting a pulse. Now, as it emits and it strikes down this uh, mass of tissues over there, so you would be getting this multiple scatterers. Now, the whole concept of scatterers is that uh, it is generally on theory that the cytoplasm to nuclear uh, boundary, so the nucleus within your cells, they are the ones which are quite hard and strong and very dense and they reflect back the ultrasound waves. Now, if the tissue these, these all these nuclei are quite densely packed very close to each other, then all of them are going to emit down and what you get down at the transducer is not the response of one of these cells, but it is a combined response of all the cells present over here. And as such when you are getting down this one, so what will happen is that your resolution is limited to this group of cells and no more to a single cell. So, even if I am increasing the number of transducer that is not going to play any significant role over there, because even by increasing the number of transducer I am still going to get for each transducer just there will be a group of cells which will be sending it back. And until I do some much more signal analytics on top of it, I will never be able to identify directly, I will never be able to identify each single cell. And for that reason, that the, the minimum homogeneous structure within your body which has to be identified is actually one cell. So, a cell can be of one particular tissue type, but otherwise, that within a small volume, there can be a mixed group of cells coming down. And what the best what you can identify always through some sort of a prop uh, analytics is what is the relative density of each of them. Now, for that uh, what we try to do is something like this, say that uh, for each of them R 1, R 2 and R 3 you have some signal coming down uh, over there. Now, at the end what happens is an estimation framework. So, it is just a consolidated uh, effort which is sent back over here and your final objective is to do some sort of an inversion of this forward pass function. Now, you have to invert it given that your forward pass is not from each individual cell but is from an ensemble and still you have to end up getting that one. And through that one you will be able to get some sort of a estimation although initially it will be improper, but eventually it would become proper. Now, in order to solve this sort of a say intractable problem, we uh, enter into a interesting fact over here. Now, this interesting fact is that uh, we make use of statistical physics of acoustic imaging. Now, for that what we do is something like this, uh, say that uh, I have different tissues which have different kinds of cellular densities over there. Now, one thing which was observed is that as you pass a um, pulse of ultrasound and then it gets reflected back. So, whatever signal you are getting down, you can actually plot down that as a probability function. So, you keep on say for this example, it will be something like 1000 times you keep on sending a pulse over there. And for each pulse you keep on recording what is the intensity you have received. So, it is the same transducer, same tissue region and you are sending number of multiple pulses. And then you just plot down a histogram or a after that you can find out a probability density of each of these amplitudes. So, the amplitude of this pulse is along this x axis which is called as r and then on the y axis is the probability of getting that value of r. Now, as you keep on doing that one what you would get down is, is some sort of a distinct curve. Now, say I did it once for 1000 I got this kind of a curve in red. Now, again I did it for 1000 times I got this kind of a curve in blue, but both of these curves are quite similar to each other that is what you will find out. Now, next time uh, for a different kind of tissue where the cells are much more densely packed. So, this may be uh, say fibrous tissue where you have very thin fibrous bundles and all of them are quite densely packed. And then if you look at them what you would see is you also get a similar kind of curve if you are doing this experiment every time, but 
there is a sharp difference between the curve over here and the curve over here. So, for different kinds of tissues you are going to get a different kind of distribution curve and that distribution curve is what is denoted by a Nakagami distribution function as we have over here. Now, this is what was the theory proposed by Mohan Shankar in one of the early papers and we make use of this whole theory of uh, Nakagami distribution of ultrasonic signals and then come down to our actual work. So, that is where we start by defining the statistical physics of ultrasonic backscattering. Now, what we did for our work was quite simple. So, we had histologies because it was done in vitro. So, that means that uh, you have uh, uh, dead bodies or cadavers from which uh, the heart was extracted out and the artery was pulled out and then there was circulating saline in a refrigerating environment and the ultrasound was acquired. So, we could do it, but then it was all a glass model and it was an in vitro data acquisition. So, from that what we have is that uh, this whole histology was registered with the ultrasound image which we have over here such that every point on this ultrasound image corresponds to a point on the histology and we decided to look into different regions. So, say I take this region over here which corresponds to this region and we know that this part is lipidic by looking into the histology on the histology reports. Now, over there we sir keep on looking into multiple times of this ultrasound going down and then look into what the probability curve looks like. Similarly, we repeat the same thing for fibrotic tissues, we repeat the same thing for calcified tissues. Now, if you look carefully over here across multiple measurements the there is a mild variation, but more or less the shape of the curve is quite sim quite similar as well as the height of the curve is similar. Similarly, for calcified and fibrotic also you have a similar trend and each of these different kind of tissues exhibit a different kind of curve. So, that definitely means if I have a parametric form of representing and that parametric form of representing is my Nakagami distribution. So, some parameters of my Nakagami distribution should be specific to lipidic tissues. So, there should be a bound of parameters or a group of parameters within Nakagami which will specify that it is it comes from lipidic tissue, there will be a group of parameters which would specify that it is calcified tissue and there would be a group of parameters which would specify that it is fibrotic tissue and this is what we make use of in uh, our problem. So, there were a lot of papers in uh, earlier days who had also made use of these kind of uh, uh, properties in order to discriminate, but uh, under an assumption that you needed to manually delineate a mass of tissue and then find it out. Because whenever you are going to do some sort of a parameter estimation within an estimator framework you would need the number of samples or what all samples to take down for doing it. So, that would mandate that you have a very cohort group of samples coming down over there which are similar to each other. Now, although like they were doing it manually, but our task over here is to make it a totally automated process where you get signals and you just analyze them. The clinician over here is not going to point out that this is my cohort region which I would like to segment out actually. So, in order to do that what we try to do is let us think of putting it into some sort of a probabilistic decision making framework. So, given that I have a value of signal r coming down or my intensity of the ultrasound image, I want to predict out what is the probability of it belonging to a particular type of tissue y and this is what it would look down in a Bayesian standard Bayesian paradigm in including your likelihood and your uh, prior probability and the evidence over there. Now, from this if we look into this uh, prior probability this likelihood function what you would see is this that likelihood is going to be some sort of a summation over multiple Nakagami coefficients and, and then there would be a weighted combination of uh, all of these different ones across different scales and together this is going to expand into different kind of polynomials. Now, in total this introduces a major challenge that we do not know what are the scales over there, what are the correlations between the scales then the number of components and the prior probability of each of these components and together that makes this whole problem as an intractable problem. Now, in order to solve this what we end up doing is we have some sort of a proposed solution in which what comes down is that say this probability this posterior probability of belonging to a uh, tissue type y given a particular signal value r and some unknown factor. So, we need to figure out what the, what this factor is if we use this unknown factor as some sort of a guidance across all of them we should be able to get that one out. Now, what we decide is we call this unknown factor as this statistical physics model of ultrasonic backscattering and I will come down to how that thing is computed out and then it was a it is a very simple process by which you can compute out. Now, what at the end we can do is that given that uh, any kind of a bunch of signals come or one one single acquisition over there uh, then 
on that you will have to figure out this factor over there and given that you have a good set of training data then using all of them you can always train a classifier which can solve this whole problem and this is what typically would be called as a transfer learning problem because you are going to transfer your knowledge from one uh, set of attributes which you have learned to learning another set of attributes over there. So, from this what uh, we end up getting is this sort of a total framework in order to do tissue characterization. So, the idea is something like this that you want to estimate the Nakagami parameters and for that what we would do is since I said that you need a finite uh, number of samples which are coming from a cohort, but the problem is that now it becomes a chicken egg problem until I can see what tissues are there I will never be able to delineate what is a homogeneous mass of tissue over there until I elim uh, eliminate and then isolate one homogeneous mass of mass of tissues. So, that I get down all my readings perfectly I will never be able to calculate what is my estimator over there. Now, what do we do in that case? So, what we make use of is again that sort of a pyramidal decomposition framework. So, we start by assuming that there is some sort of a homogeneity at a scale. So, say by starting on a small neighborhood of 3 cross 3, then we expand this neighborhood to 5 cross 5, 7 cross 7, 11 cross 11 and then keep on going. Now, as you keep on expanding what would happen is that say at 3 cross 3 it is homogeneous say say at 11 cross 11 it is homogeneous then obviously at 7 cross 7 a lower scale also it is homogeneous and any of the lower scales it will always be homogeneous that is how it is supposed to be. But then say at 5 cross 5 it was homogeneous but at 7 cross 7 it is not homogeneous ok. But all the other scales over there had a very good estimator now if you try to create at each pixel level a whole stack of these uh, estimators over there. So, that would in term end up being an array of estimators and these would be something like features of uh, a single pixel over there, but it is no more features in terms of textures or uh, co co-occurrence matrices or local binary patterns, but these are now features in terms of some estimators which uh, which have a basis in the statistical mechanics of ultrasound ok. And using all of those features we train a random forest and then so that it can do a very good uh, estimation solving over here. So, that this output is just a color blended output of the probability ones. So, this blue one is what denotes a calcified tissue, red over here is what denotes the probability of having a necrotic tissue, um, yellow is what denotes the probability of having fibrotic tissue and although if you uh, uh, we have examples later on where I would show you a sharp disc distinction between the calcified and the fibrotic which we could identify this with this method and uh, pink over here is what signifies the lipid deposition completely over there. Now, another important aspect which we make uh, use is borrowed from this one of these papers by uh, in, in the journal of medical image analysis and this was about understanding ultrasonic signal confidence and the cue what we use is that since ultrasound as it propagates to tissues and we have studied that uh, it is going to attenuate significantly and if there is a significant attenuation then we, we will not be getting very good reliable estimates. So, we need to find out some sort of an estimation about how reliable the signal is and that is what is called as ultrasound signal confidence. So, we use a typical random works like uh, solution framework in order to get down signal confidence and uh, so that is quite beyond the uh, coverage areas you can read more details about on this particular paper as well. So, what it gives out it at every point on this uh, signal acquisition space it will give out a probability in the range of 0 to 1, 0 would denote that the signal has a very low confidence over there of returning back and so the estimator might be a weak estimate or a rough estimate whereas, wherever there is a high value or close to 1 probability it means that the estimation is very good over there. Now, using all of that we fit that into a transfer learning framework. So, what we do is we have one estimation of signal confidence also an estimation of these speckle statistics of ultrasound using those Nakagami parameters at multiple levels. And then from uh, ground truth labels we learn down a random forest. Now, once this is done this, this is what is carried on in the offline uh, process. After that we start with the online process in which what happens is given that there is a signal acquisition happening over there immediately uh, all of these estimators are carried down and then this model is transferred over here such that you do a feed forward through this model and then you get down the probabilities and uh, coming down for different kind of tissues. Now, uh, one good thing is that we use a random forest for learning over there such that this makes our whole process uh, uh, 
uh, independent of topological behaviors of uh, samples as we have studied in the random forest uh, lectures. So, you do not need to understand typically as to what is the prior probability of the samples or you will not be needing to a priori know about the topology of the uh, uh, feature space on which you are going to have your discriminator coming down. So, whether you have a linear discriminator or quadratic discriminator it is independent of that and th that beauty of random forest is what helps us in learning this whole uh, feature space in a much stronger way. So, together with that uh, we did uh, prove it on an experimental data uh, which was in vitro and uh, they were all acquired at 40 megahertz uh, intravascular ultrasound from Boston scientific with a sampling frequency of 400 uh, megahertz coming down such that uh, we had in 1360 degree rotation uh, of this you had 256 such scan lines and each scan line had to 1048 samples over there. So, the whole signal space for me has basically 256 columns which is one scan line is one column and you have uh, 2048 number of rows such that each row denotes one sample along a scan line. Uh, we in total had 53 such acquisitions from 53 different slices which were from 13 different uh, cadaveric hearts. So, there were different arteries on the heart where different plaques were there and for each plaque we had one uh, typically acquired signal uh, taken down which was with the consultation of our interventional cardiologist and uh, cardiovascular histopathologist. So, they were the ones who were responsible for uh, choosing out which locations to actually sample down and analyze for them. Now, with that uh, what we got down is something like this. So, we have a method which is uh, quite good in characterizing. So, uh, on this side on the right hand side you would be seeing a uh, relative probability changes over there. So, this is the probability for finding out calcified tissue. Now, if this is the probability of finding out fibrotic tissue. Now, if you look over here the region where you had calcified tissue there is no fibrotic tissue at all co-located and that is quite um, uh, say that, that is biologically quite relevant and uh, correlated. Now, this is the probability of getting down necrotic tissue and this is the probability of finding out lipidic tissue. Now, if you carefully look between both of them since necrosis is a later stage of lipidic. So, they need to coexist in some way and you can see this coexistential probability quite distinctly coming down over here. Okay. Now, uh, this is almost quite towards the end of it. So, now for different staging is what we had. So, uh, what we had done was we had for different arteries which were in different stages of plaques and then for each of them we decided to look into how the behavior comes down. Now, from a machine learning perspective in uh, the context of medical image analysis you would often note that uh, some of these samples have missing classes. So, over here say there is no necrosis and there is no calcification at all this is an early stage. Still it is going to predict and there are no false positives coming up. This is a stage when in these two stages also there is no necrosis coming and it comes only over here. So, there are missing classes in the data itself and it is still very efficiently going to predict it out including like learning them perfectly. But obviously, if you try to learn with this sample without any necrotic example then your model will not have any necrotic learning ability as such. So, that is that is one thing which you need to keep in mind as to how to choose down perfect examples for learning. Now, from there uh, I come down to this performance uh, evaluation. So, what we had done was we had compared our predictions with uh, observers and we did do an inter observer and intra observer uh, variability scoring by, by assessing our predictions with respect to uh, the histologies over there and this was done by clinicians who are trained to interpret cardiovascular histopathologies uh, directly. So, ours is a computational model and you have an actual histology to compare with. So, if you look over here the diagonal line over here shows down quite uh, uh, close to 100 percent uh, the, some of the highest values which you see and the cross diagonal shows very low values. So, this definitely signifies that uh, the method is quite consistent as far as inter and intra observer variabilities are concerned and you can read through the papers which are linked down at the end of it for much more details. Now, from here uh, I come down to the significant point of that we needed to domain adapt definitely this whole thing and the major problem was because this has to go for in vivo instead of in vitro where it was trained. And so, what we decided was uh, we have this whole idea over here that once you have the trained model which is in vitro trained over there then we need to do some sort of an adaptation and for this adaptation part is when we make use of very small number of samples coming down in uh, vivo, but you do not have do not necessarily have a histology coming for that one. So, you just have in vivo acquisitions and the whole idea was that 
unsupervised way how can you adapt these models when you do not have a tissue characterization. Uh, so, the ground truth labels available in any of them. Now, for that uh, we did do so the since that part is quite beyond the coverage which we can do over here you can definitely look into it. But to come down to a fun part as to what we could achieve by doing it is that uh, we had fortunately for some of the animal experiments what we had was uh, we could sacrifice the animal at a later point of time. So, you could do an in vivo acquisition and then take out so once the animal is sacrificed or dead you can pluck out the artery and then do an in vitro acquisition over there and do a histology. Now, you can compare your in vitro prediction results with your domain adapted model for in vivo predicted results on that and with the histology. And if you look over here, then our method has quite consistent performance. This is the one, uh, this is the one for in vitro over there and this is the one with in vivo what we show. Now, our results which we show for this in vitro to in vivo are quite consistent with each other compared to other baselines which were very simple methods of trying to either train on. Uh, directly on this in vivo data or uh, trying to directly deploy the in vitro model in case of uh, on the in vivo data itself. Now, these are again extensions from the first lecture of this week where we were studying about domain adaptation in case of retinal image analysis and the power you could gain by using a lot of in vitro data or healthy data or, or some other experimental data to pre train your model and then just minorly adapt it to be really superior performing than having to train on limited data. So, this is the particular paper on which uh, you will find more of the details and I would suggest that you look through it. So, uh, with this we come to an end and uh, to read more about them you can read refer to these two of uh, our earlier publications. Uh, the first one has a much more detailing about the ultrasonic uh, statistical mechanics uh, and then how you can use it and the whole uh, concepts behind that. So, with that uh, I come to an end to ultrasound tissue characterization and uh, thanks. Thank you.